Martin Darcy with Goliath Tech Utah. We're at Intermountain Electronics in Price, Utah. We're putting in helical piles for a steel building. There's steel in this section, so we will be installing anywhere from seven feet down to 56. Let's go ahead and get started. So you notice it's a little bit chilly here today. We've got some icicles just coming down off of this. We've got some frozen ground. You'll see snow all over. It's really not a big deal with helical piles because we can still install through frozen ground with that. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer, but we can still get it done. And you'll see that in just a second. So you see we have a different amount of piles in each location and different, different positions on each location as well. So those, they were a little bit closer together in here, just based off of where those posts are coming down, then they're a little bit further apart. This one just was finished earlier. And so we've got different piles and you can see that they've kind of ended at different lengths as well. You could see each one has a different height. That height is dependent on where they met that torque or when they met refusal and hit the torque. So as we go on, you're gonna see up in front of me, you're going to see that we've got different machines installing at the same time. What extension number are you on? This will be extension four. So right there, they're on extension four, which means they're already 28 feet in the ground. And then after that one's in, they'll be 35 feet deep into the ground. And you'll notice with this too, this is a low speed, high torque drill. This is not your standard auger drill that you're just going around super fast constantly. Then our spotters will give feedback every rotation to be able to keep that the straightest possible going down into the ground so we can keep that. He'll give the direction. And you can see Jordan, he's up there and he can make slight modifications as he's going because he can see the level on his perspective. And then the spotter can see his perspective as well being able to go both ways. Makes it a very dynamic duo there, so they are able to make very minor adjustments every single rotation as it goes around. If there's ever a question, if it's balanced or not, then we can make those little adjustments. You can see also that Jordan's kind of rocking back and forth on his tracks. And those tracks are kind of going higher and lower, and that's to give it crowd. The purpose of that crowd is to be able to get your down pressure. If you can get the down pressure, then you're getting a nice balance. And so every rotation as it goes around, it's going in the ground about three to four inches. So right there, you're gonna notice there that that's going in at a lot faster rate than it was just a second ago. So like every time it goes around that whole rotation, you can see that it's sinking fairly quick. You're going through a water table or a silt layer right there and a silt layer or water table, that's not gonna really hold any pressure. What was your pressure going through right there? Like 400. 400? Okay, so right there, we're barely holding right at about 6,000 pounds and that's it. That pile has to hold 34,000 pounds. And so, and we're 35 feet down. So 35 feet down and we're only holding six, 7,000 pounds that's why the helical piles are really beneficial is because if you've got that layer and that's where your footings are, that's gonna sink, it's gonna settle. So what we're doing is we're gonna be able to go through, get underneath all of that, and it's gonna go from, he's on his fifth extension now, between this and his next two extensions, he's gonna go from holding 6,000 pounds to holding 34,000 pounds. And he's gonna know that because the density of it is gonna show up on his pressure gauge. In a steel building like this one, they've engineered it so the whole perimeter is still below the frost. So in this case, our helical piles are not acting as the frost protection, but they are acting as a compression and tension load. So what we're going to look at is we're going to look at the different locations here and the different types of footings that are needed with a steel building. Now with a steel building, you typically have your post that comes down and then that post has anchors that go to it. Ideally, a helical pile is placed directly below that. So let's go ahead and look to where they're at. Okay, so to explain a little bit more about why helical pile, piles are so strong and, and why we have this kind of configuration for a footing. Um, so 
we have several different sizes of piles in here. This particular pile can hold 52,000 pounds. This one can hold 44, and this one can hold 34. But if you imagine this is kind of a teeter-totter, once this is all set together, okay? So this is tied to this on top of this. So in order for that pile to move up, it has to push this one down and this one down. And in order for this one to come up, it has to push this one down and this one down. And that works all throughout this footing. Each one of these piers also has an uplift value. So it may take 100,000 pounds to push this down here, but this pier here also has three quarters of its total value, which roughly ends up being 30,000 pounds, a little over 30,000 pounds of uplift. So each of these also has very strong up uplift um, that stops them from lifting, not only being tied into these other piers, which are preventing any kind of compression. So again, that's why this particular configuration is really the strongest kind of footing you can get for lateral strength. So what's exciting about this building is that they're going to be having a mezzanine in this front section and more cranes and different types of things on the second section. So each section has different sizes of footings. Surveyors will come out prior to installation and mark where those posts that we're talking about are. You can see on the ground here, we have different marked locations that were protected by the concrete blankets. We will be putting our helical piles on these locations to be able to meet those loads. Now, this specific location requires a 267,000 pound load. So with that, to be able to determine which ones go where, the engineer has told us on some of them, specifically, this one holds this amount, this one holds this amount. For any of the others that has just the excess load, then we take that 267 and we have to make sure that every one of those piles, as we add that up together, that sum is a minimum of 267,000 pounds. So as we go and we look at the different footings, you're gonna see some of them that have two, some of them that have six, some of them that have eight. The reason that there's a different amount is because each one of those has a different load requirement. Some of our piles will hold 34,000 pounds, some of them will hold 52,000 pounds. And it just depends on that shaft and the thickness of the shaft, what each pile can hold. People ask us, how do you incorporate your pile into the footing itself? And the easiest answer, however the engineer engineers it. Basic approach with it is that you need to have at least five inches of concrete above and at least three to five inches below. And then that creates a lot of different structural benefits within the footing itself. Right, so a few weeks ago, we were out here on site and we were just starting, just right at the first. In fact, our truck was right there. Our machines were right here. There were holes here, just like you saw on the other side. And we were installing our piles over on this side. While we were doing this, the concrete guys were prepping up behind us and they were starting to form everything right behind us. Just on the inside, the excavator was excavating this section as well. So he was excavating the interior footings at the same time. The time management on that made it very smooth that we could come in here immediately after excavation, install down to 50 feet, and the concrete guys were right behind us. Typically what would have to happen at that was because as you can see behind us, we have the hill and that hill kind of rolled down. Now as that rolled down, it changed and it went from really shallow there and then it went really deep as we come through this direction. Instead of having to over excavate all of that, compact it into layers, we can come through, install below all of it, and they can come right behind us, saving in the project like this, months and months and thousands and thousands of dollars. So as we pointed out on the other locations where we have them marked with a little X, those X's are where we've got posts coming down, steel posts coming down, and those are going to be anchored onto the footing. The footing guys, or girls, come right behind us, and they form up the footing, they form it and pour it. Their anchors will be anchoring to those steel posts. Now our piles are underneath this, and then they'll be able to support that load that these require with them coming straight down on here. 
you saw on some of those where they were very dense and so they were very tight this is wise because those posts are going to be coming down over here and they'll be coming down and anchoring here so we need to make sure we're at those exact locations there are specific rules with helical piles there's different rules for frost protection. There's different rules for what angle they can be put in. One of the rules with helical piles is that when you install, the helix has to be a certain distance away from the other one. The physics behind a helical pile is that as you drill a helical pile down into the ground, the helix uses the soil around it to create torque, and then that torque is converted into a compression. You could get a larger torque typically with a larger helix in soft ground. However, if you've got really, really rocky ground, you don't want a large helix because you've got rocky ground, your large helix is going to be hitting every rock available. So in rocky ground, you want to go with smaller helixes. So we determine what helix size similar to how you choose your snowshoe size. If it's soft soil, we're going to choose a larger helix. If it's dense and hard soil, we're going to go with a smaller helix. We can still get the same load out of both of them dependent on the shaft, but how quickly we get that load will be dependent on the helix itself typically. A common question with helical piles is how much can a helical pile hold? Well, a helical pile can hold up to 100,000 pounds if it's the right size. The maximum load a helical pile can hold is dependent on the shaft size. This helical pile, this is a two and seven eight shaft with a 34,875 pound load. Three and a half inch shaft with 43,750. Four and a half with 51,786. Now that's 51,000 pounds allowable service load with a safety factor of two. So it can technically hold more, but to keep a safety factor in there, to make sure worst case scenario, it's gonna be able to hold that much. While the load capacity is 34, 43, 51,000 pounds, the amount that that can hold is dependent on a relationship between the shaft and the soil. That relationship is coming between the helix and the shaft together. The shaft itself, is going to tell you how much that's going to be able to hold total because if it go it can't hold more than that amount the helix is going to make it get to that amount faster or slower depending on the size the larger the helix typically the faster it hits that load the smaller the helix then the slower it hits that load in some soil you need the smaller helix in some so soil you want a larger helix so you have to really test out that soil to find out what's the optimal solution to keep the costs down and the structural integrity high. So the soil in this area has a mixture of larger boulders and then there's gravel, sand, and some clay in it. It's a very diverse layering in the soil. We've chosen to have helixes that range anywhere from 9 inches to 13 inches for this project depending on what load we need to hit for that. So with this line here, most of these along this line were a nine inch helix. The main reason for that is right at the first, there's a really rocky layer, but that rocky layer was not below the fill. So we, that rocky layer that was put back in, we had to get past it. So we used a nine inch helix to be able to get past that and anchor underneath into native ground under that fill layer. At the first, over there, we were hitting native and very dense ground right at about seven feet. As we go on, it went from seven, 14, 20, it was almost like a multiplication game. So as we came on, it just kept getting deeper and deeper to the point that when we came clear down over here, we were 42, 49 feet down in the ground. So we can do that by putting seven foot sections onto our lead pile and just putting those extensions on until we hit our torque. Our minimum depth requirement is provided typically by the geotech engineer, but we can also tell very clearly when we hit our native soil. And you'll see that in a little bit when we use our torque hub. 
because we can ch it'll show what that pressure is and we can really monitor that and be able to tell what's going on with the soil underneath us. We are eight feet in the ground with 469 torque. Our target torque on this is 7,555 pounds. So you can see how soft that soil is. That's holding about 6,000 pounds right there. So we have to get into soil that's gonna be able to hold a lot more than that. We're at 28 feet now. So we can see now that we've hit our target. We've actually exceeded our target. And at any point there, now we can stop. So what we were seeing there on that pile was those first few feet were not really great. But then after those first few feet, they got really bad. They got really bad till about 21 feet. After about 21 feet, that pressure started gaining just slowly. Once it hit about 24 feet to 28 feet, that's when we were getting really good dense soil. We went from holding only about 6,000 pounds to being able to hold 34,000 pounds. And that's the beauty of using helical piles. We know what that soil can hold because we're in that soil. So a couple of years ago when we started this project, we were approached by the engineer who we'd worked with on other projects as well and he started talking to us about the soils in the area and specifically on this ground they had done a geotech report on and a geo study and so we thought he said that there were some issues with the soil so we came up and did a couple test piles the test pile is where you bring in your excavator or your skid steer and you drill a pile in until you hit refusal with each test pile, we had drastically different depths. For instance, we were looking at 45 feet at the far end over here, and then it got shallower and shallower. And then as we came around and then did the, what is now this building over on this side, when we were doing these test piles, we found the same thing, not quite as deep, but it kind of ebbed and flowed throughout. Definitely some water table issues within it and some areas that felt a lot like fill. So when we did this first layer over here, installing this, then there was a lot of shell in it. And one of the things that was required was that we break through one of those layers so, because there was some very soft soil underneath. So we had to break through a couple of those layers with an auger, break through it, and then continue till we hit our torque under there. What, one of the things that we learned with that was that that geotech report that's really our guide, that's our Bible, that's our exact instructions of what we've got to do. We're like in the construction zone. So while installing, we had to use the geotech requirements, the structural requirements, and making sure we met both. Even though at first we were hitting the structural requirements when we hit that shell, it was really dense. The geotech requirements required us to break through that layer we broke through that layer, we're able to go underneath and then make it so that building that you see here is now very stable. We have piles throughout the whole foundation, through the footings on the outside, through the interior footings, as well as underneath every one of these exterior footings. There's a pile under every one of those to meet those load requirements coming down from the roof. So that way, you know that the building's gonna stay as well as the overhangs. Hi, I'm Jake Ory. I'm the construction manager here at Intermountain Electronics. We decided to put in some heavy cranes inside of this new building. When we went to the engineers, uh, our dirt is not very good here. So we ran into some issues with being able to carry the loads. Uh, we had some options uh, on a previous project. We had to over excavate uh, extremely large pits where the columns were for the cranes and we had to uh, put engineer fill and compact layer by layer. It was super expensive and time consuming so this time we were looking for something different. Uh, the engineer uh, decided that we could use helical piers and he had experience with Goliath Tech. Uh, that was who he recommended for us to go to to get the piers put in. He calculated all the loads. They've been here on site, putting the piers in the ground, and everything is working out really great, saving us a lot of time and energy that we put out on the last project. So 
we're pretty happy with what's going on here and looking forward to working with these guys on our next expansion. So not only are helical piles an excellent option for structural stability, they're an excellent option for efficiency for time. We were able to work with the concrete and excavators to be able to keep everybody on track as we started with them originally as they're building and forming their concrete walls around the perimeter. We're staying ahead of them over on the side and they're behind us just forming and pouring those. As we finish up this back wall, then we'll be able to continue on with our piles on the interior and then they'll be able to keep on track right behind us. So we don't have to stop in the snow. We don't have to stop in the rain. We don't have to stop if it's frozen ground. We do stop for lightning, but when we can count to a couple Mississippis, we typically start back up again. We'll keep you on track. We'll keep rolling for you. This is Darcy with Goliath Tech. Thanks for watching. Stay warm.